City Club members, friends, and community members joining us here at the River House and watching us online, welcome. My name is Jacob Fain, and I am your City Club of Central Oregon Board President. For those joining us at the River House today, please find information at your table on how to submit questions for our Q&A and to participate in our audience questions. And for those online, please look in the chat for this information. Before we begin today's program, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the tragic shooting that took place last month in Bend. As we've seen numerous times across the country, a young man, 20 years old here, found a solution to life's problems by taking the lives of others as well as himself. I'd like to recognize City Club board member Ruth Williamson, who wrote a very moving letter to the bulletin as a way of expressing her grief and asking hard questions after this gruesome event. In her letter, she wrote, how are my actions and choices a part of the web of intersections that allow this kind of suffering here? In 2017, The Atlantic published an article titled, How Iceland Got Teens to Say No to Drugs. The article details research-based system-wide change that involved the government, parents, educators, children to reduce addiction across Iceland. The results were staggering. And one example, the, the number of teenagers who self-proclaimed to be drunk in the month prior reduced from 42% in 1998 to 5% in 2016. So how are our actions, our choices, allowing this kind of suffering here in Central Oregon? Who's being left behind? Who's feeling marginalized? Whose problems are we ignoring because they're not our problems? And what are we gonna do different to respond to these and many more difficult questions? With that, I'd like to thank our community platinum and gold sponsors and partners who bring us together each and every month to look inwardly on Central Oregon, to learn, to engage in these tough conversations, and to grow as a community. Please join me in thanking our supporters, ASI Wealth Management, the City of Bend, Central Oregon Community College, Oregon State University Cascades, St. Charles, Pacific Source, Central Oregon Association of Realtors, and Brooks Resources, and today's supporting sponsors, OSU Cascades and Central Oregon Community College. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> and moderating our forum today is Chloe Crabtree. Chloe's the sponsor relations lead at the Bend Chamber. Chloe grew up in a small town in the Appalachian Mountains of Western North Carolina and migrated westward in 2015 after finishing her degree in sustainable development at Appalachian State University. She also serves as the board secretary for Boys and Girls Club of Bend and is committed to helping further their mission and serve local youth. When she's not working or volunteering, you can find her writing comedy, binging podcasts, biking, snowboarding, or hiking with her partner and pup, Bryn. Chloe, please join us up here. That's a great introduction. Thank you. Wow, that was, thank you for the bio. How many of you guys use your degree? Wow. <laughs> the difference between boomers and millennials. Okay, we're gonna talk about it. Um, not to segue too quickly um, and make it fun, but I would love to make it fun today. We're chatting about millennials with millennials. What a joy. Maybe we'll even cover why we don't use our degrees. No. <laughs> um, so we've got an exciting day ahead of us. I think we've got some panels, so please silence your cell phones, but keep them close by so that you can participate in polls and questions. Feel free to whip those out. So millennials are also known as the Generation Y. And we've talked a lot, especially in the last year, 18 months, two years, I don't know, about recruiting and retention. It's been kind of hard. 
I don't know if anyone's noticed. So we kind of want to dive deeper into this idea around what has shaped millennials and why millennials are in part the way that they are. <laughs> because they're stepping into leadership roles right now if they haven't already done so. And so we really want to kind of maybe demystify some things, have an open discussion, and hear from you all about, you know, what do you really want to understand and know? I think it's kind of the reaching across the aisle and being like, how can we understand the individuals that are shaping politics or our places of work in our communities? So this Generation Y, predominantly born of boomers, I know, shocking, I'm a millennial as well. Um, we've actually been out of college for quite some time. I think sometimes I chat with folks and they're like, aren't you still in college? Like, no, haven't been there for a while. Um, we most notably have been shaped by the expansion of the internet and social media, the Great Recession, which I know was fun for everybody, and 9-11. And we actually surpassed the boomer population quite recently. Not that it's a competition, but we did. We're bigger. Um, so we're really going to get into this discussion to chat a little bit more about those major events that have shaped millennials, their worldviews, challenges that they face both personally and professionally, decisions they make, and ultimately how we can better support them in their personal lives, and their professional lives, because ultimately they'll be leaders. If they're not already leaders, they're emerging leaders. And if we want to continue to build a successful and thriving community, we really need to encourage millennials and the generation who's stepping into these leadership roles. So without further ado, no one's having issues with a mentee poll, I hope. OK, we're good to go. Um, so. Further ado, I welcome Zavi, Borja, Laura, Lauren Simpson, and Katie Pelchar. I love how I tripped up your names here at the last second. Please come visit me on the stage. Love that microphone feedback. I'm trying to figure out how far away here. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves a little bit and also chat maybe about one or two things in their lives uh, that have really shaped who they are. And so since you're closest to me, I'm going to let you go first, Katie. <laughs> All right, awesome. Katie Felcher, I'm a sales manager and loan consultant at Loan Depot. Um, in my bio, if you read it, um, I did the millennial van life, and so I think that that kind of shaped who I was. I grew up in Welch's, so a really small town. Went to Monmouth, Western Oregon University, also a very small town. Moved to upstate New York in another small town. <laughs> but across the way, it was kind of neat to just pick up everything that I owned at the time and just plant my roots in every city that I stopped at, and it felt like... Um, the world was a little smaller after being in such a smaller town and to be able to see a lot more. So, yeah, Bend is the biggest city I've lived in. <laughs> um, I'm Lauren Simpson. I'm a product manager at Sutera. We're a global sustainable pest control company here in Bend. Um, I would say an event that shaped my life is I lived in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands for about three years. Um, after I graduated college, and I was a dive instructor there. I managed a shop, and that was my career in my life for a while. And um, it was, as Chloe mentioned, I, I'm a millennial, definitely. And so I graduated into many poor economic climates, and that was an opportunity to earn a living and also kind of explore. Um, and I realized that I'm a born and raised Bend girl, that I wanted to be here. So I kept kind of coming back and coming back, and it was a really formative experience for me, as well as a lot of fun. Hello, everyone. I'm Xavier Borja. I work for the city of Bend as a community relations manager with an emphasis on partnerships and equity. And I think 
the reason why I'm here, right? It's like I was born in 93, right? So that is a life experience that has shaped me into the world and environment in which I'm in. But I think personally and like professionally, I think was moving and living in San Francisco. So I grew up in Madras. I was born in Redmond and grew up in Madras. I've lived in Bend now for like 11 years. Uh, but being in a huge metropolitan city, I was really exposed to these conversations around like DEI, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion and what that meant and what that looked like. And I realized at that time, this was like in 2018, that wasn't really happening in the area that I was from and especially in the area that I grew up, um, which made me want to come back, which again, ultimately shaped who I am today, again, outside of being born in the time that I was born, which makes me a millennium or millennial. Um, and so that in itself is shaped me. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so it's behind you awkwardly and we don't have to, I'm, I'm getting on board with this technology. Kim is very good at this stuff. And so if I'm, millennials are known for being great at tech. That is not true. I'd like to demystify <laughs> that immediately. There are still problems with that. So I can't see it on my iPad, but um, this is the age range of millennials in 2022, which is, which is interesting. I think that a lot of folks- um, They got it right. <laughs> they did they get did. it right. And so you graduate college in what, usually like 23, right? So when people are like, did you just graduate? Yeah. And you're like, Most no, it was a while ago. <laughs> I've been done. <laughs> and so here's a couple terms that come to mind um, as far as what you all think of when you think of millennials. So young, adventurous, work-life balance, active, creative. I love techie. That's hilarious. Um, job jumper. That feels good. Um, progressive, self-absorbed. I love the honesty here. Let's get into it. It's all um, anonymous. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so great. Purpose, social media obsessed. Yeah, self-absorbed, self-centered, optimistic. Okay, so now that we have a full scope of millennials, do you guys have any immediate reaction to these? So many. You guys really <laughs> yeah, so, us up. So many. Yeah, jump in, Zavi. You want to start? Sure. Any that you um, agree or disagree with? I yeah. think the first thing is like this job jumper, right? So like... My mom calls me the shiny boy, right? I've never had a job longer than probably like two years, I think because of that. But I really reflect on it and a word that sticks out to me is that work-life balance, right? So I think we millennials think of work very differently to where we want to incorporate a lot of our personal life and our personal experiences into our work. And when and if that doesn't coincide, then it's like, well, let me see, there's so many opportunities. Like it's at the, my fingertip, I can go on Instagram and everyone's like, oh, we're hiring, we're hiring. And if it suits me, then I might be able to explore that um, because it fits better with my personal life and my ideas um, rather than, you know, uh, one organization. I think that's interesting. I've been in my job for five years, so I don't know that I would call myself a job jumper by any means in the career before that three years. Um, but I think that we don't necessarily want to be job jumpers. We don't want to change careers every two years. I think it takes in a lot of places a year or more to really kind of get your feet under you and for the organization as well, it, it benefits if you stay. But um, as Zavi mentioned, a, a work-life balance can be <laughs> funded by your career, right? We're not um, there not for a paycheck. We are, we're in a career and in a job. And so I think our generation demands that those things continue to, those needs continue to be met. And if they're not, then we'll move on and find those needs being met somewhere else. I think the statistic is something like a 20 or 30% raise every time you shift organizations. I, what organization can you think of that gives someone a 30% raise every two years? Especially <laughs> in Bend. Yeah, exactly, yeah, in, in this type of community. And so um, there's a lot of opportunity there to, to move on and there's no, there's no shame in that. We, we almost, I would say, as a generation take pride in the fact that we are supporting ourselves and advocating for ourselves and finding those opportunities in, in new places. And we're strong contributors when we're there, we're fast learners. So um, hopefully when we move from place to place, we're, we're contributing as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'll add on to that. I mean, obviously that's a big one that stands out to me too, the job jumper, which is such a big change from the family I grew up in. Um, my dad was a sole income earner for my whole family. He'd been at the job since he was 18 years old and moved from New York to Oregon. He retired 
three years ago, maybe, after 33 years in the, in the same field, same job. So a totally different perspective to them be now, like, what am I going to do? Like, I might have more opportunity here, but I also find it like at some point you also, I, I've also been at the job for the last six years. So mind you, I'm not jumping around too much, but I see the, the value in getting different management, getting different opinions and providing more to it. Um, I think that his pension, his opportunity for retirement, what he got out of it by the, the long term in the company has also changed drastically as I start to see my 401k match come down a lot and a lot of you know different dynamics aren't the same level that they used to be. And so now we look for those opportunities. But I also read a really interesting t- statistic on how much it's actually costing um, the, the whole country on just those job changes. So Maybe, maybe something to think about as you are trying to find ways to keep that retention, um, how much it could cost you in rehiring for a new one too. Yeah, if it costs you oh, $55,000 to train a new employee, what would it cut? But are you paying that to keep that employee? Yeah. Maybe that makes us self-centered no. or <laughs> self, self I mean, concerned. I really or like empowered. rebel on here. I don't know who put that in, but maybe I add it to Instagram. I don't know. I liked uh, Instagrammy. <laughs> yeah, Instagrammy. That's a good one. That was a good one. Yep. So, rolling into some questions, um, what are some things that inspire, animate, and challenge you? I know that's a big one. Take your time, but not too much time. I'm on an I, agenda. I think I think Instagram, um, Facebook. That's all like so much of what shaped us. We've had um, social networking. Gosh, when I was uh, in eighth grade, I got my first Facebook account. I think that that was about when, when that came in. And before that, it was MySpace, MySpace. right? MySpace. <laughs> and so we've always had this access to comparing ourselves to other people and having that reference back to kind of where we are. So what inspires me is... Um, totally just seeing other people in what they're doing in their jobs, what they're doing in their lives, right? Like I want to be as successful as I can, but I also want to enjoy things outside of work as much as I can because that's what I'm constantly seeing too. Um, I have a unique job in being in sales that I do want to encapsulate as many people as I can. If you guys ever need a home loan, right? I want to be the person you come to, but I also want you to want to work with me. And sometimes it takes kind of taking that barrier away from that. Um, obviously, I'm not going to wear a suit and tie, but <laughs> if, uh, if you do, that's a totally intimidating factor now for a different generation. So um, it inspires me to be my authentic self um, at all times. And I think that that takes me further in my career. I want to build on something that you just said. So we've looked at the age range of millennials, and I I must be the older of our millennials here. I I don't know, but I didn't have, and I think the the point about it is that the technology moves so fast. So our generation may be close in age, but the changes that happened within us were were so quick. So you had Facebook in, what did you say, eighth grade? I didn't get it until I was a freshman in college. Um, I didn't have MySpace until middle school or AIM in, in the end of middle school, right? So um, although we are all in that same group together, our, our generation's one of the first that had those changes happen so, so quickly. So even just within a couple years of each other, it's it's different. Our lives were a little different. Um, so that didn't answer the question, but I, I thought that was really interesting. I was yeah, kind of good. shocked by that. Yeah. What inspires me? I think so much. I mean, the biggest thing is the future. I think the possibilities, and I think inherent, mm, inherently humans have, in, have inherited this resiliency. And I think that's kind of where we're at when we think of like the future of work and like what this looks like. And I'm thankful for my employer to kind of have that in like a policy to figure out what that looks like, understanding that things are and are going to continue to change. I reflect, so my sister and I are 10 years apart. Um, so two of her years in high school were virtual, right? Two years. And I really reflect on that to her. That was her and that whole host of generations norm, right? To where I'm thinking like future of work with work-life balance, technology, all these different components So it's like how are we or can we we and are we setting these things up for not only ourselves but for the next generation to continue like these successes of our organizations of our nonprofits of our co- corporation profits all these different things and kind of tying into profits where I think 
for myself personally, and I think a lot of other millennials, it's we're trying to tie this con this concept of profit and purpose and trying to see where and what that looks like from an individual standpoint, but also understanding that it's like, okay, we've experienced a lot of these things that Chloe had talked about, whether it's like 9-11 or, you know, just, you know, the internet itself, like we're really connected almost too much, we could argue, right? But I think being thoughtful and intentional with those things, I think is something that really um, inspires me and, and, and I get excited for because I think we do have an R playing a part within that. It's just being really thoughtful as we move forward within those things. Shameful plug, because it is a chamber. Um, <laughs> it's a chamber program, but I think I already did the shameful plug. Oh no, <laughs> I got that's that fine. Out of the way Why for not? You. Let's do it. We're millennials. Um, <laughs> is <laughs> being around uh, the young professionals group through the chamber, and also going out and chatting with folks through chamber events, and really being exposed to so many different demographics and age groups here. That's so inspiring for me to hear from so many different sectors and really talking to folks who are both younger and older and hearing what's on their mind, like what's important to them. Why are they here in Bend or Central Oregon and what do they want to contribute? That is something that's inspiring weekly, honestly, is just hearing from everybody. Um, I want to pull the last part out of that original question, which was a little dense, sorry. <laughs> about the challenges. It could be personal or professional or a combo, but I'm curious what, what has been really challenging, um, especially in recent years, other than COVID, but feel free to chat I'll about start. that more too. Um, so I have been just recently speaking with my manager about this, but um, similar to that sort of generational divide or changes or separations, um, I think that we as millennials got a lot of bad advice from from older generations. And, and by bad advice, I mean advice that helped us get where we are. So it, it, was, it was successful in the way in which we did it, but it's not necessarily socially advancing or, um, you know, DEI <laughs> friendly, right? Like I, I know that I, I dressed differently today than I dress at home. If I came up here with my top knot and my leggings on, you guys wouldn't have taken me as, as seriously or, or wanted to listen to what I have to say as much, right? So I don't necessarily want to give that advice to Jen, what is it, ZX? Z, Gen Z, sorry, <laughs> X is before, Z is after. I don't, I don't want to give that advice as a leader to the people coming up behind me. It's, it's where I got where I am today, but it's not necessarily good advice. And I think that that's a huge challenge currently in, in leadership because this next generation behind us really demands to be authentic. They demand that they get to show up like themselves. And it's it, to them, it's not even a demand. It's just what you do. Um, and I think millennials don't, we don't feel that way, right? Like we're like, we, we tried our best to conform. We did this over here, we listened and that's what got us here. So we're a little bit more as a generation, I think timid. Um, and I think that can be very challenging because you're, you're looking at, this, wrap it up, sorry, you're looking at this advice and you're saying it got me where I am, but also I don't necessarily want to give it to someone else. Um, so finding a way to, to balance those two things has been a, a challenge for me as a emerging leader recently. <laughs> I kind of want to play off that. I think just in what you said is a challenge, something that I wrestle with as well. That's like, I, I internalize that as like um, assimilation almost in a multitude of ways, right? It's like you, you thought or think that folks here in this room, depending on maybe they're not millennials, will not take you as seriously if I'm not dressed the way that I am, right? And kind of taking that for me, it's like, okay, how do we have to maybe like rebel, right? It's like push that a little bit. You know, sometimes at work, I'll wear like, you know, jean shorts. I'm like, oh, like you look so comfortable. And it's like, yes, that doesn't mean I'm not, not productive. That doesn't mean these other like kind of things that we're like, okay, the workforce, the workplace, professionalism means these things. I think that in itself is a challenge. So it's like, we're trying to conform to be a part of these conversations. But at the same time, it's like, we're also trying to wanting to be like ourselves and like our own, bring our own flavor, our own, you know, ideas within that. But at the same time, in order for us to get there, we feel the need to conform, whether it's like, you know, this formality of an email, formality of the way I dress, formality of the way I speak, whatever that is, to be at that table of decisions to then move whatever it is forward because of that inherently, whether it's true or not, I think there is a lot of validity to it. But again, it's just like, if I came again, if I came up here in, 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 in sweats and a tee, like maybe not as serious, right? But 
who knows? It, it can apply to other things too, right? Like even topics, like bringing politics into the workplace or just opinions or thoughts, right? So like we, we had a, a, a shooting in our town, we were talking about it earlier, right? And to come into work and to feel like you can speak about that or you can't speak about that because immediately other, other things or other affiliations will get assigned to you, right? So how do you bring your whole self to work? How do you discuss challenging topics while still remaining professional, while respecting people and their differences? And I think that's a big challenge that we face and it's different generationally. Once again, I think the generation behind us comes in like, what do you mean you're not gonna talk about this? Of course, like this is, yeah, I'm just gonna state my opinion and we'll all move on. And us as millennials and probably boomers are like, don't, don't ever say anything. And millennials are like, oh, maybe, I don't know. But we tend to like water it down or not state our opinion, but just talk about the fact. Um, I think social media has taken that in a lot of different ways too, because um, it goes both ways, right? Now we have the access to knowing what everyone is like, and maybe you are connected with people you work with, or maybe you aren't <laughs> intentionally for that reason too. So it kind of, um, the access to having more insight and more um, everything kind of shapes a lot of that. So, um, but I did make the decision to wear tennis shoes today. <laughs> and, and I went to my boyfriend and I said, do these shoes look better or these? And he said, uh, tennis shoes are more you. So I went with that. <laughs> but my, my, my challenge, I'm going to add, um, obviously I'm biased in working in the housing and being in Bend, but I think the obvious um, affordability and cost of living versus wage increase has been a huge part of what shaped us as a generation. Um, I lived with roommates until I moved in with my boyfriend now, and I know that I couldn't afford to live in Bend independently by myself um, at the wage that I was at when I was growing up through the early stages of my career. And so I think it's really common for um, you know people in their late 20s, early 30s to either live with parents, live with numerous roommates, not just one, or live with um, multi-generational, I guess, you know, honestly, I've had parents move back in, so I think that that's been an interesting one. I think you brought that up, Lauren, but um, that changes everything of who we are too, right? If you're living by yourself, you're shaping who you want to be, where you're going, versus me living with my friends, like my day in and day out was very different. I played board games and drank beer often on a weeknight, <laughs> which probably wouldn't have been the case if it was by myself. So I think that's really shaped who I, who I am. I like that you brought up the bad advice because I think that's something really interesting. I don't think obviously that advice was given thinking man, I wanna lay out bad advice for this next generation, but it was a completely different economic time. Mm -hmm. So folks were giving advice based on what they grew up with and their college experience and their lived experience and like copy paste, it doesn't, it doesn't pencil. <laughs> and so I can, t I can understand and see how there, there's a rub between generations now of like not understanding those points and how that didn't carry over. Um, I think that's a good segue into our next question, which is how can you know our community, our employers, maybe even our peers, really help support young professionals and millennials, um, you know, personally or professionally? I'll take that right away. I think, I think because there's so little of a line behind professional and um, what's the other word? <laughs> Personal, thank you. <laughs> the other P word. Um, because there's such a blurred line there, I think it's really um, important to open that door, to be transparent, to take time outside of work if that's where your role is, if you're in a leadership role, to find out who they are and show them that you respect them regardless of your differences in it. Um, I think Bend is a well, my biggest community that I've been in is still a very small community, and we've been really lucky to um, have our city council's like debates that you can, I ran into him at Little Woody, all of Tatum, right? <laughs> all over Tatum. So it's just neat to have like the very different um, opinions that, that you might run into the person and be able to have a conversation and speak your differences in a respectful way. Um, but just that being the same as far as respect for, um, you know, you ski, I snowboard, right? Like it's a different thing, but it's just a commonality that you can just make the ground um, a little different on. I'll go next, sure. Um, I think remaining 
open to different qualifications is something that people can do to help service our generation in particular. So, um, and, and especially within our community, right? We have a not a resort community per se, but there's a lot of like tourism or or other. What, what is the word I'm looking for? Recreation-based professions that, that hospitality. people- Hospitality. Yeah, hospitality, yeah. thank you. Um, and those those people who are coming out of those positions, I worked in the restaurant industry for a long time before I worked at Sutera. And the most, the best skills that I have that I use every single day and now I'm in my corporate professional job come from those restaurant industry experiences. Um, they come from managing a dive shop and they do not come from my bachelor's of science in environmental economics. <laughs> um, and so I think remaining open to different ways that people can get to a position that they're in and then once they are in those positions, continuing to remain open to different ways of work. So um, making sure to focus on the results and the things that people are delivering and not necessarily the way in which they got there. So if I take an hour off to go to a conference for a kid, my son, or I, you know, have a doctor's appointment and I, or I participate in Bend YP and I attend a monthly meeting for that during the nine to five, um, which is definitely not what I work, but um, meaning more, sorry, <laughs> um, please listen. Uh, but like, you know, understanding like what, what you deliver out of that can be the same. If it doesn't matter that I check in from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every single day, it matters what I'm contributing to the organization and, and the, the top line benefits that we're getting from me as an employee. So um, remaining open to the intro and during. Um, I would probably say I would encourage folks here in the room, right, to use this as an opportunity, like now that it's maybe more front of mind to like talk to your employees, to your employers that are millennials. I think they have the answer, right? They, whatever it is that they need and are wanting, listen to that and also like execute on that. Like whatever it is that you take from here, whatever it is that they say, try to in encourage and put that throughout your organization. And I think as far as like a community, to me personally, um, would probably be housing. Um, I think, you know, you brought up a really good point and that's like for me personally why I've jumped to so many jobs to where it's like, I cannot wait for somebody to retire in 15 years and work at this like mid-level job at like 17, 20 bucks an hour and especially in the live and bend, right? So I think understanding that concept and that kind of like synergy within like those two concepts and understanding that to, as a community, whatever agency you work with, to try to advocate for, you know, whatever that looks like in terms of um, housing. There's a lot of like things that are around, right? You know, affordable housing, workforce housing, whatever that is. But I think really utilize your platform as an employer uh, to ad advocate for those for the future generations um, like us and after us. Another great segue into our last question before we hear from Good you guys. Time. So what are some obstacles that exist today in career and your life uh, that you feel are holding people back, whether it's yourself or maybe your direct peers? Um, debt. I don't know, home That's buying. Debt. Yeah. Yeah. Debt's so fun to talk about. Let's talk about it. No. I think, yeah, I, so this is something that I am on the opposite not typical millennial side of, I got the greatest gift that I've ever been given, which was from my parents paying for my college education. Um, I'm one of very few people that I know that does not have any school debt. I have no, no student loans to pay back. Um, and that afforded me access to a lot of other opportunities after, after graduating, especially when graduating into a poor economic climate where jobs weren't readily available. Um, so I think that is one of the main challenges for my age group in particular. Um, many of my friends are paying student loans and they can't add a mortgage on top of that or s use that money to save for a down payment or something different um, when, when they've, they're paying for the education that may or may not have gotten them the job that they currently have. Um, so I think that debt is a huge, huge challenge for our generation in particular. Um, but we all experience it differently, right? Like that's, that's not my challenge, and yet I still cannot afford to buy a house here in Bend. Um, so I think affordability and debt go sort of hand in hand. And I'll kind of play off that to where it's like, I mean, 
folks know how like that works, right? It's like my debt to rent, my debt to income ratio, right, is not skewed, but it's like it's limited because of like that debt, right? Because like my generation, my parents are like you know go to, go to school, get a good job, buy a house, you're set, right? But if I were to buy a home right now, my mortgage would be three grand. Right, so like, I think that's a perspective as well. To where it's like, there's not a lot of jobs. Like, trust me, I would love to work still at the Boys and Girls Club and be at you know the games room staff if I could make a living, right? But I think that's not the reality. So trying to find in an area, a sector, an employer that can support or try to support the trajectory to which we're at, to which a lot of us in this room know, right? So I think that is a huge challenge, and to and want to stay here, um, but frankly, just cannot or that's a huge challenge to really start to think strategically of like can I see myself here long term in or not let's say five years maybe I want to be but I think that's a big challenge for a lot of millennials to where again like three grand is quite a bit for a, for a mortgage and back to your point to where it's like okay now I have to live with like three four different people which is like fine but at the same time at some point I don't want to do that um, but this area doesn't necessarily allow that um, just the given circumstances and and what it is again copy and paste right it's like Went to school, got a degree, have a good job. Still cannot, though. I think that's a huge challenge. And I think, too, like adding to that, our generation is that we're getting married older. We're having kids older. We had that chunk after education that was really challenging. And once again, that economic climate, we didn't get that head start, right? Um, and so to what Zavi was talking about, at, at 32, I... I don't necessarily want a roommate at 25. Yeah, man, sign me up. But like, that wasn't the opportunity that we had at those younger ages. So um, some of it is choice and some of it is circumstance for sure. I think it's both. If you don't classify as a millennial at 25, raise your hand if you had a roommate. Pretty, pretty minimal. <laughs> yeah, anyways, I was just curious just hearing you say that. I think that the challenge is definitely on, um, uh, I want to say, the cost of living in general, which is what we're going to co keep coming back to. But what we're not taking into perspective is the cost of living and how that's going to affect us in retirement as we get to that age and how um, we're not having children. So we're not setting us up for success in having um, an easy retirement either, because we've talked about the sonstemic we've your um, old manager had brought up um, to me of just, we're gonna get to the retirement age. If the economy is in a good position, we might be able to <laughs> retire, and then are we going to be able to and still have enough people to satisfy the life that we want to live, um, as far as being able to employ the jobs that we um, are leaving or vacating. So it's a really interesting, I think that that's probably gonna be the hardest Thing. Um, meanwhile, we are hardly finding enough to be able to afford a house. Are, do we have enough to be putting it away into 401k? Are our employers helping us put it into a 401k? Like I see this so much from uh, home loan is obviously not financial planning, but when I talk to people and I say, hey, we just want to look at your reserves, how much do you have in a 401k? And it's 35 year olds that have nothing. It's really hard for me to stomach that <laughs> because I know what that translates to and you guys probably do too. Yeah, like what's going to happen to Social Security? <laughs> Social insecurity was the was right? the good. <laughs> well, I don't have kids because I just cannot afford them. Like it doesn't pencil out for me to have kids for at least like seven more years. And by then, why have them? Okay, why have them? Um, all right, let's have some fun. Let's pivot to you guys. You guys can ask questions and I'll stop asking sorry questions. Sorry to leave that on such a somber I know, note. I'm, like, I'm so mm. sorry. Katie and I are both raising kids. So yes, can't yes. afford a house, can't afford kids. I'm, I think it's great you guys are doing the kid thing. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> I think that just, so just to touch on that, and I thought it would come up naturally through it, but I wanted to bring up, so Lauren and I um, both have been in our long-term relationships now with her fiance, which is very fun, um, but I've been with my bo boyfriend for just about five years, and he has an 11-year-old daughter. He's on the other side of the spectrum, nine years older than me, <laughs> but he's still in the millennial category, so kind of fun to be in the same household with very different perspectives of what we went through in the recession to where we are now, and him having gone through raising um, actually two kids um, from his ex-wife and his own child to now we have her 50% of the time too. So um, that lifestyle is not something I saw for myself growing up <laughs> with um, 
you know, married parents with a dad that had the same job for 30 years to now being in a um, mixed household with um, lots of different, I mean, the life happens, everything's very different, but it's very common. You know, Lauren and I, when we met, we finally started talking about that and learned that um, there was someone else in the same social circle with us who also was in the same situation. His, his girlfriend, older, with a 13-year-old, he's the same age as me, and... If you want to share, not to. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, co I co parent a senior in high school. He's a 17 year old. Um, and yeah, that his, his father is five years older than me. So um, very different challenges, I think, for both of us in our formative years, obviously. Um, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I, we were just recently talking about my engagement. I just, just got engaged and um, <laughs> nothing, <yeah. laughs> um, thank you. Nothing um, has really changed for us. It feels very similar to, to my partner and I, um, but our families feel very different and um, it's pretty interesting. C extended community also feels a little different. There's, there's no word for co-parent of child in the, without referencing um, your partner, but there is a word stepmom, right? Um, and so it feels a little different to be received differently in that way. But um, I think a lot of people in our generation have sort of similar situations or, or different situations. There's a lot of unique family dynamics um, that, that millennials experience. So. See, and I'm very opposite, right? To where I'm like, <laughs> I I'm like, by like fear almost, maybe like from my parents, or like just like circumstances where it's like, I need to have everything set up before I even think about doing those like things, right? And I'm 28, so I'm just like, okay, I need to really have my, my stuff set up. Cause if not, then it's like, I don't want to be in a position to where either my parents were like in 08, right? Whatever that looks like to again, like for me, it really is like almost fear to like have that stuff set up or to try to ensure that that is set up. I thought it was worth mentioning as the Q&As come. <laughs> no, I love it. I should have been looking at the Q&As already. So I was listening you to time. you guys. Yeah, no, you didn't. Um, ooh. That one, yes. Yeah, that one. Let's do this one. Um, let's see. Again, the technology. I'm bad I was like, at yeah, Kim, too. I've got it. I have it. I have not reached the end of the presentation. Oh, no. Okay. What I remember of the question... And if you're the person who asked it, please feel free to jump up and, and say the full question. Um, but could we chat a little bit about quiet quitting? And I know there was a second part to this. Thank you. God, I'm useless. I've seen this um, on the internet recently. Yeah. I've never heard of quiet quitting. Oh, quiet I have quitting. heard of quiet yeah. quitting. It's like, pretty new. It it's I believe that it means... Um, no, it has nothing to do with quitting, actually. It, I believe that it means... Um, like showing up to do the base level of your job. So not, no longer going or above being, and beyond. Or being a remote worker oh, and okay, cool. not being as present. Is oh, that okay. the other idea of it? Uh, yeah, it's real. Fel I guess we have a definition yeah. for quiet. Uh, Does the um, question asker have a definition for quiet quitting that they'd like to share? <laughs> doing, doing the bare minimum, minimum. Okay. okay. She was right. We've ended the presentation again. I might do a hand raise here. I know Jen Greco and I have talked about the quiet quitting quite a bit. Um, I, I don't know. I think that's an, that's an interesting. I've never heard that concept. Um, I, it's like the opposite of hustle culture. Literally, I unfortunately can't resonate. Like I, it sounds. Not, I would assume it's because. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, it, it's, it's, uh, it sounds, it honestly sounds just like this, of like, if this employer, my, my person who, who's giving me a job is not going to value me for, like, my time, all the things that we've talked about, then why should I care? Why would I show up and give, like, my very most when, like, they clearly don't value me in whatever way, monetarily, by, like, my wage or by my work-life balance, whatever it is that I'm needing? That's what I think for, when for it comes me, to For me, I think my... that comes down to not having expectations correctly set. Um, remote work, COVID, everything has kind of shifted shifted how the job role entails and what it is, right? So if you're feeling like um, someone within your your staff is not stepping up to the standards that they should be at, you, you don't have the means to fire them at this point because you are trying to find anyone else to fill the roles that's probably missed too, right? Like we're all short staffed. So with that being said, setting the right expectation and um, giving that for me, right, if I was in that role as an employee, I would want my employer to set the expectation and then to say, um, 
this is why I expect it, and this is what you get out of it from doing it too, right? How, how is it going to benefit me and you? Because if me just being there and punching the clock is enough for you, and you're not okay with that, then I'll just find another job, right? <laughs> I think that that's yeah. ultimately what it would come down to. I take so much issue with the term itself. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's a misnomer, firstly, um, which just sends me through the roof. But um, the, the idea itself, I, I guess I'll give a little bit of a hot take, I feel like is how boomers worked. You, like a older generation got a job, you met your expectations, you came home at the end of the day. There was no hustle culture. And that is so ingrained in millennials to like, you've got, got to be above and beyond. You have to work, you have to earn it. Um, and so, yeah, more more power to you if you're gonna quiet quit. Like, are you, are you, are those the goals that, and the outlines that your manager has set out for you? Are you achieving them? Um, it, is there a reach goal for you? Do you, has that been established? Has someone told you that it's expected that you do more? And if it is expected that you do more, then why isn't it included into your compensation, your goal setting, your future planning? Um, there, there should be no quiet quitting and I shouldn't have to work more than anyone else around me to, to get noticed. I should have stretch goals and goals that I can meet and that should be my job that should be defined. Well, and we're available all the time. You know, boomers did not grow up with technology where like I've gotten three emails on my watch since I've been sitting up here. You know, so that there's, been on the back I, I don't of your think, mind, probably. I, I don't think, <laughs> oh gosh, I don't think anyone set out thinking, man, I'm going to just take advantage of these millennials because they hustle so hard and they should be available. And that, you know, provides a greater return to my business if they're available 24 seven. I don't think, I really hope no one expects that, but <laughs> I think that that, you know, to your point, the hustle culture, and I think this is funny coming full circle because now I can see the full question. Um, <laughs> totally different. That's already that's already gone. Uh, but it's it's interesting to me that it's translated as la laziness sometimes, when really to your point, it's expectations. And I think like having that constant and continuous conversation about how do you approach me as a manager? How do we approach one-on-ones? What are the accountability measures that are on paper as KPIs? And what are they as far as like office culture goes? Like what are the Can you cultural KPI? <laughs> key performance indicators? Thank you. There Thank we go. You. Okay. So oh, hold what up. can I add to that really quickly? If it's fast, Lauren. Okay. No. <laughs> well, now I just forgot. I just forgot what I was going to say. Never mind. Go ahead. I got another email. Okay. So what do boomers expect from millennials that is not reasonable? We might have already just touched on it a little bit. I, I think to be available all the time. I work in marketing and product development. The projects that I work on have three to five year time horizons at, at the shortest. Some some things are involved in, in product launch for the year and um, there is no marketing emergency. <laughs> There is, there is nothing that will come up that, you know, happens at 9 p.m. that cannot get solved at 7 a.m. the next morning. Um, so I think, you know, we are, I, I'm not saying that you should only be available during business hours, but um, to respect the, the boundaries of work and life and that you get more, you get your employees to show up better and more refreshed and contribute more when you allow them to do that in the time frame that they are they have put bounds around for themselves i was going to say we're not experts on all technology that's the unreasonable oh, yeah. expectation. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, we may we may know a bit but every time that someone's like, "Oh, you've got to know how to do this." I'm like, "No." Nope. I had a, a Gen Xer teach an Outlook some seminar to a lot of millennials. We were like, oh, wow, that is that function? Cool. I want to take that class. I think the, what, like the, what was the question again? Like, what is an unfair burden? or Unfair expectation. expectation. expectation oh, from, from I think it's, to me, it's just, I did it, so you can too, type of thing. I think that concept can be folded into a multitude of, like, different scenarios, but it's like, I did it, so can you, you, you got it. I paid off my student loans, right. so can so you. So can you, right? It's like, <laughs> I did that, so therefore you should be able work. to too. I don't know why you're complaining, still show up to work, like, blah, blah, blah. Um, you got it, type of thing. <laughs> so which has, un, 
fortunate. I don't say unfortunately, but like made us I think extremely resilient and try to like push through a lot of these things and or want to like work more because we need to go to that next level or whatever that looks like. Yeah. I literally have to keep asking questions because it'll scroll up to the top. So I'm going to take this opportunity to answer question six. Um, it's a long one. Brace yourself. How can we learn from the barriers that this millennial generation? has faced in order to create pathways for the next generation of leaders, them youngins and professionals, what are the next steps for the community? God, this one's so hard because I barely understand the younger generation. It's such a, it's like <laughs> the puzzle. I'm sure boomers feel the same way about millennials. Like what the heck is up with them? And I talk to people in their early 20s and I'm like, I'm sorry, you're speaking a different language. Like what did you just say? No cap? I just learned that over the weekend, and I won't explain it because I don't know. But Zavi? that's that's so that's so real. I think just that concept itself is something I struggle with too. Through, I was like, I'm not even old, and again, like I use my sister as an example because we're ten years apart, right? And I'm just like, I have no idea what you're saying, but I'm like, okay, if this is how the younger generation. My sister's always she just got her first internship job, right, um, at KWSO out on the, the station on the reservation, and she was like, I don't know why people email all the time. Can't we just use Snapchat? And I'm like. <laughs> What? <laughs> right? I mean, and it's hilarious, right? But it, but it's, but at the same time, I'm like, that's so real. Like her and like that generation really thinks like that. To where I'm like, okay, like that's a real concept. Like they're really thinking, like are really questioning and challenging in their experience, young, right, in the workforce, to be like, okay, really rethinking how we're communicating, how we're doing work, right? So I think for me, it's taking that with like reality and being like, okay. Uh, like try, I don't want to say understand it, but just empathize with it to where, like, you know, you said, boomers probably think of those things of us, right? And it's, like, really honing in on that and trying to work with it or have them at the table, kind of the same things that we were expressing around ourselves for the younger generation. I think having them at the table, I think just opening yeah. that conversation, understanding if, if the barriers for us have been cost of living and affordability, bringing them at the table and having that conversation about what they, what you think we would do differently that would benefit them better. Yeah, and like we're remaining open, right? So if Snapchat is suggested as a form of contact, it's, it's sort of that like bad advice thing again, right? Why do we immediately go, absolutely not? What, why are we, yeah, we, like, yeah like why, why do we say that, right? So the, the same thing from the, the boomer generation or Gen X to us, like if we make a recommendation or a suggestion, take a minute to say, why, why do I feel like this is unprofessional? What about this is challenging my level of norm out, like norm? What, what's different here? And does it need to remain that way? Or can it shift? Should I learn how to use Snapchat? I do not know how. What? Like, I, I don't <laughs> believe that that's a way to, so my initial reaction was absolutely not. That's not a professional way to communicate. But I don't know anything about it. Maybe, like, maybe it I, could be. I don't know. And I had a back and forth with her about that because I was immediately, same thing, not a chance. And I used, like, my work setting as an example. Like, well, there's, a lot of, there's some legality within that. But she's like, if I want an attachment, you can send an attachment. If you want to send a quick picture, I can send a quick picture. You can save it. You can have it there. You have it in the archives. It has a cat like you can save it all these things so i was like maybe maybe may like, I, I don't know hasn't snapchat always been the, that it can disappear maybe they've learned from us and that all of our things from our past are coming back up <laughs> they're like no we got to get rid of that the, the memory, Please. Like eight, like, years, no. eight years later <laughs> we answer the question? Oh, you totally did. And then I was like, wow, these iPads are pretty cool. I kind of want one now. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> these iPads. Um, oh, God. What... What are the, mm, nope, I don't like it. It's negative. I want to end on a, uh, on a light note. We're coming up on time here. Um, so how can City Club better engage with millennials? I think that's a great one to close us out since we're here with City Club. Thank you, City Club. Um, Change yeah. the time. Change, like the clock, Savi? What yeah, like they, daylight Same savings more. time. So like, let's, yeah. no, I think again, we're, we're, we're like <laughs> mid-level, right? It's like there's a, and I don't know, like everybody's employers. I'm thankful again that my employer allows me like to do these things, right? But at the same time, it's like, I mean, you know, not in a bad way, but I mean, look at who's in the room, right? It's like changing the time that fits within a schedule, um, I think makes 100% sense. Um, and get, we want them to be engaged, but at the same time, it's like if we want that, then we need to meet them where they're at. We can't just expect them to meet, again, the same mold that we are able to, or the folks that are at the table to do that. Um, so meet them where they're at, and I think the biggest thing is change the time.
instead of hearing so, so when I was Ooh, your age. That's a great, great question. question. Uh, I, that's a great if question. I had I've actually dime. come up with that in a lot of different events that we've done because a lot of there we go. our other uh, other people in employment are working at um, restaurants in the afternoons too, so that makes it mm -hmm. hard. Yeah. So maybe just a, a fluidity of times. <laughs> I would say evening. Evening makes sense. Like, yeah, evening after. Not exactly after at 5 p.m. Right. Yeah. Well, ask if they want advice before you give it first. Yeah. I did. That sounds really negative, but like I think too, which we we're not going to break open here and now because we're at time. But I'd also selfishly like people to think about the millennial and boomer power dynamics across genders. Because I think that millennial women coming up in leadership role and how we're maybe viewed or treated um, from boomers and, and also other millennial men is a really interesting um, interesting puzzle piece because you don't necessarily, I don't think anyone's trying to do this, but you, lo you look across at your other peers who are about your same age and maybe a different gender, and, and this goes for men too. They're treated differently than some millennial women, especially coming into management roles, and it's really unfair. Okay, thanks for coming, guys. Um, <laughs> oh. Um, I think that, do you have a, a yeah, quick a add-on to that? I was just going to say, you know, as you kind of go back in your workplace or you have that, I think that um, as, a, as I was progressing through development, career development, just being approached by people in the um, higher stages of their career, coming to me and being open to having conversations really shaped who I've become too, because I've learned that that isn't a hard barrier. It's always felt like there's these big... Um, structures are conforming like you can't those people are better than you you can't talk to them and so it was really opening for me to have you know Katie Brooks for an example write me on LinkedIn and say I'd love to talk to you the next time so you guys have a lot of power in how much you um, reach out and engage with people in the younger generation and I think I would encourage you to explore that um, and that goes for anyone in, in any generation reaching out to different generations it goes a long way but thank you so much for having us. Yeah, uh, Katie you. just did my closing, so like I don't f <laughs> d to regurgitate it. Please just talk to the people around you and the younger folks. You know, as far as those who are coming out of college right now, like they have TikTok. <laughs> they have TikTok. They have this whole language that we don't understand, and so just. Remember that you know y you have to ask the questions and come at it with curiosity rather than this like. Well, back when I was your age. Um, anywho, thank you guys so much. I'm going to hand it over to Kim now, finally. <laughs> thank you. So we had, again, about 20 questions that we didn't get to. And I will send those to the panel. Uh, it seems to be about 20 every time now. But you also all probably have millennials in your life. And those questions that you might have asked today would be a great question to ask them, whether it's your children or grandchildren or coworkers. Um, I, I, they were all perfectly appropriate to ask uh, those you know. So thank you to Chloe, Zavi, Katie, and Lauren for being here today and leading us in conversation. And we greatly appreciate this partnership with the Ben Chamber Young Professionals and to Jen Greco for helping us coordinate this forum today. They worked with us over the past, I don't know, four or five months. Uh, and then thank you to our elected leaders here today. Um, from uh, We have from the Parks Board all the way to County Commission represented here today. On your table, there is a uh, rat card from Envision Bend, who presented at City Club back in June. And when they were here, their survey wasn't quite, quite ready yet. And um, there's information on there about how you can participate in that survey and the um, eventual results for the future and vision of Bend. And then finally, on Tuesday, um, our last Tuesday forum, uh, Tuesday, October 18th, join us for a conversation about whether Central Oregon could be next for ranked choice voting. Uh, City Club is also participating and partnering in a number of local and state candidate forums. And those are all coming together as candidate forums do last minute. So cityclubco.org is your best resource to find the dates and locations for those candidate forums as well, to submit, as well as to submit questions to the candidates for those forums. Thank you for being here today. Please continue to cultivate conversation about issues um, that connect us to build a strong community. Thank you.